Strange Wills. Stories of Strange Wills made by strange people. Starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William and featuring Lorene Tuttle and Carlton Young with Howard Culver and an all-star Hollywood cast. Original music by Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Greed, despair, envy, hate, jealousy, pride, and anger. And here is Warren William. These are the stories about strange wills and the secret lives of the even stranger people who made them. Time, places, and names have all been changed so that no reflection can fall on any person or persons, living or dead. Only the sin remains. Remains like a shrouded ghost of the dead departed, offering neither understanding nor solution. You'll presently see what I mean, but first, here is a brief message from your announcer. Now here is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Seven Flights to Glory. Everybody in town knew Lucy Witherspoon. She not only was a leader in the charmed 400 circle, but had more than doubled her deceased husband's fortune during the ten years that she had taken over the actual management of his sprawling industrial empire. But even Lucy was not immune to the call of the black angel of death. All her doctors... All of her power could not keep Lucy Witherspoon in the land of the living. And when she finally realized that death was but a matter of days, she called me to her country estate to help put her affairs in order. Now see here, John Francis O'Connell. I want no high-sounding platitudes or advice on how I am to distribute my estate. After all, I own it, not you. That's the trouble with you lawyers. You think you know everything. Well, you don't. (laughs) Lucy Witherspoon, the years haven't softened you a bit, have they? You're still as tart as a glass of, well, crab apple jelly. I'm not trying to... Don't try to fool me. I know what you're up to. You want me to leave my entire estate to my son Robert, now don't you? Don't tell me you don't. Of course I do, Lucy. That's no secret. He's your only child and a fine young man. (laughs) Fine young man, fiddlesticks. How many times have I tried to get him interested in my business? Now, you know, you know. Don't try and say that you don't. Yes, yes, Lucy, I know. Time without end. And you've never succeeded. And do you know why? Yes, yes, I know why, John. (laughs) Because Robert Witherspoon would rather waste his time painting pictures. He wants to be an artist. (laughs) My son, an artist. (laughs) And you know, too, John, that I've always been opposed to such nonsense. For five generations, the Witherspoons have been industrialists. And now I have a paintbrush dauber to carry on in the Witherspoon tradition. Ah. Yes, but... Now, you listen to me. Listen to me. I'll have no more words. This is the way I want it to be. And this is the way it shall be. My entire estate to Robert Witherspoon if he will assume full management and responsibility of my business for a period of 15 years. You understand? Yes, Lucy. I have an alternative that he can accept if he should prefer. 
should my son decide not to accept the responsibilities of honest work, and should he persist in painting a pretty girl or some silly mountain rather than building an industrial empire, well, then I will give him the sum of $5,000 and a ticket to Paris. Yes, yes, that's it. Five thousand dollars and a ticket to Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Bob. Come in. Hello, darling. How have you been? Well, I was a little worried. I thought you'd never get here. I'm sorry. I've been in my attorney's apartment on important business. Oh, and how is our good friend, John O'Connell? Not so happy. You see, Kay, since Mother's death, I've given three months of careful thinking to the two provisions in her will, and... Well, I've decided against taking over the management of Mother's business affairs. Decided? Oh, but Bob... Let me finish, please, darling. Kay, dear, I want to be an artist more than anything in life. I have a different sense of worldly values than Mother. I want to create. I, I simply have to. And so, well, I'm here tonight to beg you to come to Paris with me, struggle with me, and if necessary, starve with me. Oh, Bob, really? You're joking. I was never more serious in my life. Kay, I'm taking the $5,000 Mother left me and the ticket to Paris. I'm renouncing everything else. Now, won't you come with me? Life will be so wonderful, Kay, something I've always dreamed of. A studio on the left bank, and oh. an artist colony with flower stands and bookstalls sprawling along the Seine, and then the Louvre, the, the famous churches. Oh, Kay, there's only one Paris in the whole world. Bob, I, I think you've lost your power of reason. You would give up a fortune of millions, honor and position, to live the life of a vagrant artist. And you expect me to give up my social position? My family, my friends, to starve with you? Well... I shan't do it. If you're the fool I never believed you to be, go right ahead. But if you do go, remember this. I'll break our engagement, definitely. I see, Catherine. That old tradition, like father, like son. That's exactly how I feel, Robert. Like father, like son. There are no two ways about it. Either you assume the responsibilities your mother left behind... Or... I'm sorry, Kay. I'm very sorry, because I love you very much. But if, it, but if it's either or, then I take Paris. It's no use, Bob. She won't be here to see you off. Well, John, I sort of thought that she could at least have come down to the boat to say goodbye. Well, don't you understand, Bob? Catherine is bitter. You've cast off something that just isn't understandable to her. You've tipped over the apple cart of tradition. Yes, I know. I guess even she couldn't understand how I feel about being on my own. <laughs> Tossing over a fortune isn't done every day, is it? <laughs> no, it certainly isn't, Bob. But you've tossed over more than a fortune. You see... You've ended her dream of the merger of two great fortunes and families. Listen, John. You've been my mother's friend for many years, and mine too. Now tell me the truth. How do you feel about it? Am I the fool Catherine says I am? Yes, Bob. In my opinion, you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, wait, Bob. I'm not through. But if you are a fool, you're a glorious one. One that I envy with all my heart. Thanks, John. You, you've got me all filled up. I, I didn't... Go to it. Work like the very devil. And unless I miss my guess completely, within just a few years, you'll have a certain young lady awfully sorry that she didn't go on this glorious adventure with you. All ashore, what's going ashore? All ashore, what's going ashore? Well, goodbye, Bob. And remember, I know and understand. And when you need me... <laughs> I won't forget, John. And thank you. The next three years brought noteworthy events. The first was the fashionable church wedding of Catherine Whiting to the multimillionaire architect and man about town, Harrison Blake. 
The second incident was likewise of tremendous importance. All the papers carried the story. Robert Witherspoon, American artist residing in Paris, had won the Parisian Academy Award and had captured first prize with his picture called Chansonnet. And three months later, I received a long letter from Bob. He asked me to extend his congratulations to Catherine. He also told me that he had just married a young French girl, the model of his prize-winning picture. Her name was Germaine André. Two marriages and no compromise. One had followed tradition and had married wealth and security. The other had cast off wealth and security and had married his model. Well, things were really getting interesting. Almost a year later, I received a cablegram from Bob asking if I would fly over and attend his first exhibition in Paris. <laughs> you bet I would. I made arrangements to leave the following week. When my plane arrived, Bob was waiting to greet me. John! John, it's great to see you. And I'm most happy to be here, too, Bob. It's almost like a family reunion. But, uh... Where's Jermaine? Let's get in one of these so-called cabs, John, and I'll tell you about it on the way home. Uh, taxi, taxi! Uh, Rue Campesi, s'il vous plaît. Oui, monsieur. Oui. Now then, John, I'll tell you about Germaine. You see, when I married her, her greatest happiness came from the creation of something beautiful. She had no money. Her only income was from the few francs a day that she earned posing for the artists in the colony. To me, she represented an ideal. That man must live to create first and think of himself last. Well, as soon as I started making money, all that seemed to change. Well, what do you mean? Well, Germaine tired of living a bohemian life. She wanted clothes, wealth, security, position. In fact, uh, outside of Catherine's belief in tradition, there wasn't any difference. No, I think that's quite understandable, Bob. And I still believe that there's a middle road for both of you and Germaine to follow. We'll talk about that later. Oh, by the way, as long as you brought up the subject of Catherine... I've got some interesting news about her. <laughs> I suppose she gave birth to an heir for her dynasty. No, not that. Quite the contrary. She flew to Reno last week to file suit for divorce. Part two of Seven Flights to Glory will follow in just a moment. And here again is Warren William as John Francis O'Connell. As I climbed up the seven flights of stairs to Bob's studio, I wondered if this was the price of genius. Only one more flight, John. Don't give up. I shan't give up, but, uh, but must you artists always... Pick out places like this? <laughs> just wait. Just wait until you see it. Ah, here we are. Presenting the inner sanctum of art, 
My studio. Well, how do you like it? Oh, it's, it's magnificent. What a wonderful view of Paris. Why, um, I could almost paint here myself. <laughs> I knew you'd like it, John. Look out over Paris. Chimney tops, flower boxes, slate roofs, dormer windows. Uh, you see, look way over there to the left. Ah, uh, Eiffel Tower. And where all of those trees line the street is the Champs-Élysées. And that, uh, that patch of green is the Bois de Boulogne. Uh, it takes my breath away. <laughs> What's left of it? <laughs> <laughs> it's been my inspiration all through the years. Ah, John, how I love Paris. The happiest days of my life have been spent right here. I slept, painted, and ate right in this room until... Why did you ever leave this seventh heaven? I didn't want to, but Germain thought that uh, we should live in a more pretentious place and just keep this as a studio. I understand. Tradition rears its ugly head. Yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> security, tradition. <laughs> oh, well, enough of this. Let's drive over to the galleries. Germain is over there supervising the hanging of the pictures, and uh, the exhibit opens tomorrow, you know, and... Uh, well, keep your fingers crossed. Germain, this is my very good friend, Monsieur O'Connell, John Francis O'Connell. Well, I'm happy to know you, Monsieur O'Connell. You will pardon my appearance, oui? I've been very busy with the pictures, but now voila, it is fini. Robert will make a lot of money from this exhibit. N'est-ce pas, chérie? Well, I, I hadn't thought of the money part, Germain. Ah, this pumpkin, Monsieur Connolly, never thinks of money, only the art. Oh, it's so difficult. Well, that's what comes of being a real artist, perhaps, Germain. Real artist, oui. You find them by the dozen in the Latin court, and all of them starving to death. <laughs> I tell Robert that he should cultivate rich people and paint their portraits. <laughs> then he makes much money for his baby. <laughs> I want very, very much to take him to America after this exhibit is over. There are many rich millionaires there. Many would pay him much money. But, Germain, dear, that isn't what I want to be. I want to be an artist, not a leech. I've told you before, and I say it again. I'm going to stay right here in Paris and do the sort of thing I like, just as we did from the beginning. D don't you understand? Je ne comprends, Robert. I do not understand. We have starved long enough. We sell the pictures and go to America, no? No, dear, we stay in Paris. Pablo, if we stay in Paris, you shall stay alone. Joanne, you, you can't... Hey, excuse me, both of you, for intervening. But let's wait until the exhibit is over, and then I'm sure you can both compromise. I'm sorry, John. Terribly sorry. I... You will excuse me, monsieur. I have melated headache. Perhaps that is why I'm so disagreeable. Bonsoir, monsieur. <laughs> Monsieur, Monsieur O'Connell, oh, it's wonderful, très magnifique. The exhibit is grand success. Already we have made two million francs and more pictures to be still sold. Now you shall see. I shall take Robert to America. He shall be a rich fellow. Now, I'm very, very unhappy indeed, Germain. His exhibit has really made him quite famous. All of the critics agree that Robert has a most brilliant future. Where is Bob? Oh, at his studio. Oh, Monsieur Connolly has been such a bad boy. He's sulky, like, what you say, stubborn mules. He wants to stay here and parry and work and work. He never wants to have fun. It's not my province to interfere in your domestic problems, Charmaine. And I don't intend to do so. I only hope that uh, you both make the right decision. Bob is an artist, a real artist. I'd hate to have anything happen to have that. Have no fear, Monsieur. He can still be an artist in America, but he will have to learn that he must paint first to sell and then for the sake of art. That night, Bob took me to his favorite rendezvous, a little Parisian nightclub in the Latin Quarter, which bore the dubious name of L'Amour Eternel. Eternal love, eh? I wondered about it as I went in the door. Oh, this is where you artists gather. I never would have suspected that you were so frivolous, young man. I used to have a lot of fun here once, John, when I was an inspiring artist. Now it's sort of turned to ashes in my mouth. The great illusion has ended. Oh, don't take it so hard, Bob. Tremaine has really done a lot for you. Once she was your inspiration. 
she modeled for your greatest picture, remember? Yes, I remember. Little Germaine. A crust of bread she asked for in those days. A crust of bread and a franc. And now it's angel food and a pocket full of diamonds. <laughs> well, lots of girls would do the same thing. Listen, John. The last time I saw Paris... I remember that last night I called on Kay. I was whistling, and as I walked up to her home, boy, was I in the clouds. <laughs> well, I suppose she's got her divorce by now. It's too bad. What's done's done, Bob. Wasn't it Omar Khayyam who said, the moving finger rights and having rip moves on? Nor all your piety and wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Very apropos, nor all my tears wash out a word of it. <laughs> well, drink up, John. Champagne, the golden wine of forgetfulness. Here, let me fill your glass. Ah, here's a toast to Paris, the beautiful, the magnificent. And to your happiness, Bob. Yes, my happiness. It's sort of all bound up in that song. Yeah. No matter how they change her, I'll remember her that way. I left the next day for London to conclude my business affairs before returning to America. Quite frankly, I was worried over Bob's marital happiness. I felt sure that if Germain succeeded in bringing him to America, his great genius, his grand illusion, would shatter to bits. But what could I do? What could I possibly do to help him? A week later, the problem was solved without my help. Bob called me at my hotel. It'll never have to be the last time I saw Paris, John. I'm staying on right here in my studio. Well, you must have done some fast talking to Germaine. You bet I did. It was easy. <laughs> that easy? Sure. She took the two million francs from the art sale and gave me a divorce. She's sailing for America tomorrow. She said if I wouldn't paint portraits of the millionaires, that wouldn't stop her from meeting them. <laughs> I'll be through with my work here in about ten days, and then I'll fly back to see you before I go home. Chin up, Bob. I've got to start all over from scratch. All I need is another model. Uh, you better bring one back with you. <laughs> okay, Bob. I'll look around. All Bob needed was another model and a new inspiration. Well, I'd see what I could do. But it couldn't be a smash through center. No, it had to be an end run. The situation called for some Rockney deception. Two weeks later, I was back in Paris. I went immediately to the studio. Bob wasn't there, nor was he at his apartment. I searched the whole quarter for him and finally found him at a sidewalk cafe. He looked wretched. I'll get over it. I'll get over it. It's just that I... <laughs> well, I know how you feel, Bob. Anyone would. I can't understand human nature. It's got me puzzled, John. Idealists today, money grabbers tomorrow. Boom goes their ideal. It's got me confused, utterly confused. Well, let's not worry about it for the present, Bob. Tell you what we'll do. Come over to my apartment at the hotel for a day or two. Forget your studio. Forget art. Just for a little while. Then come back to it with a new approach. Yeah, I wonder if I'll ever come back to it. It's like bitter wormwood tea. <laughs> it won't be hard to forget, believe me. Bob slept at my hotel the better part of the next two days. I came back to my apartment just as he was getting up. <laughs> John, I feel as though I've been sleeping for 20 years. <laughs> well, you practically have. This is Thursday, and you went to bed on Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> Feel better? Like a new man. <laughs> Let's go out and have some breakfast. You mean lunch. It's almost two o'clock. Okay, lunch then. And after that, we'll ride over to your studio. I want to take one last look at the view before I leave. You're leaving? Oh, no, please don't go just when I... Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. I have to return to the States at once. I have some important legal work. Oh, of course, of course. It's selfish of me to ask. But don't worry. I think you'll get along all right. There's nothing been done that can't be undone. Hmm. 
This is the last time I'm going to walk up seven flights for a long time to come. Seven flights to glory. A little bit tarnished just now, but I still love it. As soon as you've found a new model, you'll start over? Yes, but no more entanglements. From now on, it's art. Pure, unadulterated art. The next time I hear a girl say money, I'll well, ring. Here we are. Permit me to uh, open the door. Yeah. Uh, John. John, where did you... Where did you find that model? What a figure. Golden hair, wonderful proportions. Uh, hey, you, turn around. I, I want to see the face that comes with that perfect back. Uh, Catherine. Kay. Okay. Oh, Bob. Oh, Bob, darling. What on earth are you doing here? How in the... I moved to Paris, Bob. I took a job as a model. Mr. O'Connell offered it to me. You... You want a model? I, I can't... It's true, Bob, it's true. I want to be your model. And I'm going to live right here in the Latin Quarter, if you'll let me. Oh, I was so wrong. So wrong. Don't cry, darling. I was wrong, too. But come on, take off that robe and put on your dress and we'll find a place for you to live. I found one already. You have a place to live? Oh, I don't believe it. Where is it? It's, it's here, Bob. Right here in the studio. Here? Here with all this paint and smells and canvases lying around? Uh -huh. See, I... I thought we could both live here very nicely. Both live here? Both of us? Yes, darling, both of us. This morning I stopped off and got us a marriage license. I thought maybe we'd still have time. Time to... Time to start our glorious adventure? Oh, yes, darling, we have. A lifetime from this day on. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell us more about the probate cause of Seven Flights to Glory. But first, here is a brief message from your announcer. And here again is Warren William. Needless to say, Robert Witherspoon became one of the great contemporary artists of our generation. His pictures hang in every famous gallery on both continents. Catherine and Robert still live in their studio seven flights up, and nothing in the world would make them leave. Is money, power, tradition so important in our lives? Well, ask Catherine and Robert about it. I'm sure that they wouldn't change their view of the Eiffel Tower for the gold of Midas. I wouldn't. <laughs> Would you? Next week, I'm going to tell you the story of a strange will that defies the imagination. An old professor discovered how to pierce the secret of the past, and for his medium between the present and the shrouded secrets of antiquity, he used the mind of a beautiful, charming young lady... What he saw, as she lived again in the world of a billion years ago, well, you'll get the shock of your lives. We call this strange story, The Girl from Shadowland. This is Warren William inviting you to be with us again next week. Strange Wills is written by Ken Crapine and produced and directed by Robert Webster Light. This is a Teleways feature produced in Hollywood. <laughs>